The telescope learning is something we've been learning for probably 20 years. Um, and uh, they originally were quite small affairs, but since we've got onto the internet, they've exploded. And, and what it's aimed at is trying to get people who have telescopes for Christmas, uh, particularly young kids, and it's amazing how many people buy telescopes and have no idea how to actually use them. You're one, eh? Yeah, that was the kids. Right here, we just want to make the Yeah, that looks like a really good one. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it's really tragic when uh, and we get lots of people turn up and they say, you know, I bought this telescope and I just can't figure it out. And yet they've spent thousands and thousands of dollars. And um, uh, rather than try and learn, they just sort of read the instructions and go on to them. And so we said, well, no, what we'll do is we'll, we'll run a telescope learning day and people can bring their telescopes and just turn up and we'll do um, demonstrations and try and explain how a telescope works and how to set them up and how to get the most fun out of them. And um, we have a variety of scopes since I'm up the front here. Um, this, of course, is the, the uh, Hubble Space Telescope's model. Um, and uh, the uh, ABC uh, used to sell these for the uh, um, what was it, live viewing stargazing, yeah. Um, and and they, they sold trillions of these. I don't know why the hell they did it. And um, so I've got a telescope up the front, which I'm going to pull the bits and just show you what's inside at least this type of telescope and, um, and how they work. And uh, I have a little star cluster which we'll have a look at later. Hard to bring the star cluster into the thing. Now I'm hobbling around and I'm hobbling back. So occasionally I might have to sit down. Um, so first of all, I thought I'd give a quick talk on the uh, uh, history of telescope making. Um, that one, does everybody know what that is? That's the Great Melbourne Telescope. Um, and about 1890, and uh, you can see the telescope in the bottom corner there, um, and the ASV and the museum and that are trying to actually resurrect the Great Melbourne Telescope. Um, I'm not sure whether they'll really do it, but they'll attempt to do it. So there it is there. Um, it was a public, a public telescope, so the general public could Come along and have a look through. Uh, you just had to turn up. Um, it was, as far as telescopes were concerned, it was a bit of a flop. Um, it was what I would call a transitional instrument. I think I have done by ways of order. It it's, was a transitional instrument in the, um, the end of the 19th century. In the uh, telescopes were converting from um, reflectors on metal to reflectors on glass, which is the way that they do today. So there's, uh, that, that, that's a more modern telescope, exactly the same as that one in principle, except much more sophisticated in design. Peter, if I may, I just had a couple of comments there. I'm actually working on that thing every Wednesday at the museum. Yeah, you'll try to figure out how it all bolts together. We're trying to get around the museum so that work actually happens. Okay. Um, but in 1868, when it was built, it was in fact the largest fully steerable telescope in the world. Yeah. And uh, you say it was a flop. Uh, in one or two areas, maybe, uh, no one was prepared to make a glass mirror of 48 inches at that particular time. It just, as you said, transitioning. So it was a specular mirror, which is copper, bronze, tin type of stuff. Yep. Um, but even it got burnt in the Canberra fires in 2003, so a few years before that was actually done some very important work, well, well, standard stuff, in the Macho project. And uh, 
Yes, we're trying to give it a false life at the moment and a uh, bit of bureaucracy getting in the way. Yeah, but we're trying hard. <laughs> the, um, I, I, I think the problem that, well, I know you guys have had, the, the problem is deciding, trying to find my way to disappear. Um, is trying to decide which telescope to build because there are several versions of it. Oh, I don't know if it's done with that comment too well. It was rebuilt. It was rebuilt. So oh, yes, it had two or three live suits. A lot of it was actually in the museum in 1984 when they rebuilt it last time, so it didn't go through the fire. But the, the main components that you see uh, there, um, that, those cones at the end, uh, and the cube type of thing in the middle. Um, they went through the pod, they're cast iron, so it doesn't really matter. But in fact, it's got some cracks in it. <coughs> yeah, I agree. Right, so when you look at telescopes, I'll probably turn these lights up to see, see that. Pick green. In the history of telescope design, um, all of these sort of inventions and things go through a series of phases. They go through a series of phases. The first phase is usually a curiosity phase. So you get people looking at things and it's a curiosity. So early telescopes, or at least the early optical systems, were seen to some degree as magic. And the first, um, the first uh, identifiable telescopes were actually sold uh, uh, under a white magic banner. Remember, this is this is in the uh, 1700s. The next phase is it becomes an art form. Uh, uh, artisans start making uh, these sorts of things, and then the third phase is. They figured it out and the technology is there, but people keep it secret. So there's a secret technology, and certainly telescope making went through a phase when it was all kept under wraps. And then finally, they went into commercialization, which is what we've got today. And so I'll just talk about those. Curiosity, um, the first references to telescopes was in the mid 13th century, and as I said, they were seen as uh, black magic. The closest you could get to what we might call a telescope was a, a lens that was put into the front door of the house, and you could see people coming up the pathway. Right, <laughs> sort of practical use of uh, appropriate lens. Um, then the, uh, these brothers in um, Britain um, started making. Uh, instruments and they in fact made those uh, door windows so that there were a large quite large lens and you could see with about a times one or two magnification who was coming up the driveway uh, and they were seen as somewhat magic and, and I might add that when they tried to sell these to the military they were seen as being able to cast spells on the on the enemy. So you can see this remember this is at a time when people believed in that sort of thing. Um, in the early 1600s the first description of, uh, of a telescope as we would see it was um, put together by Hans Wipschat and he tried to get a patent which was refused. And the reason it was refused was because the design was already well established. Um, so he said, oh, well, fuck that, we'll, um, we'll uh, make a fortune by selling binoculars, uh, which he did. Um, then in 1609, there was a, a letter that was ultimately sent to Galileo, I think, um, which showed a drawing. It doesn't actually show very much, but in the rest of the letter, that it described how it was supposed to work. And um, so we started to see 
the first, I wouldn't call that technical drawing, but the first drawing. Then we get into the art form. So Galileo uh, managed to get hold of um, information and told him how the telescope might work. And uh, he was actually chasing um, Lippershaw, I think, who was um, trying to sell a telescope that he had. Um, but Galileo figured it out in a, in a sort of crash course of research. I'm looking over the weekend. And he very quickly built a, a rough uh, scope, uh, which was today would be recognized as the first official telescope. And he sold it to um, the local government. Um, the interesting thing is that this is the first application, the first time we saw an application of a scientific instrument, uh, of a, a scientific method in instrument design. He actually sat down and thought out uh, how to design a scope. And so it was also the first recorded use of scientific instruments. Then Kepler, who was around at the time, uh, he was, um, uh, had been uh, uh, working through the uh, observations of uh, Tycho Brahe. Um, he actually did a, a mathematical study of how telescopes work, which he published, and he put together a design for a refractor, which is this type of thing here, using two convex lenses. His design was um, uh, better. His design was better than Galileo's. Actually, much to Galileo's advice, and uh, the first. Kepler based refractor uh, was built in 1630 and it was found to have a much brighter image and a much field, much wider field of view. The very early telescopes had extremely narrow fields of view. You couldn't look at the moon, you could barely see any. And the, the way you used them was to set them up and just let the sky drift through the field of view. Um, then, as glass bank, no, at that time glass banking was pretty dramatic. My background was in glass banking. And I can tell you, the glasses in the uh, uh, late 16th century and 17th century was pretty dramatic. Uh, you could make good glass, what you couldn't make was clear glass. The sort of glass we've got, which you look through the window, you couldn't do that. And the very early um, telescopes, the refractor telescopes, the glass was extremely dark. Um, and the, the uh, manufacturer of glass was pretty hit and miss. They didn't have a procedure, and most of the glass manufacturers had their secret mix to make the glass. And all sorts of weird things went into the secret mix. Uh, I remember that uh, sheep's dump was one of the things you threw into the glass mix. Um, I don't know if it made it clear or not. Um, they were the sorts of things that, that um, people used. And while you could make a lens, the problem with the lens, apart from the fact that they didn't transmit a lot of light, was that they were very simple lenses and they suffered from what's known as spherical and chromatic aberration. Spherical aberration is where the lens will focus in the middle of the optical acid, but the, but the outside of the field view is blurry. Your binoculars are like that, unless you've got a really good pair. If you hold up a pair of binoculars and you look to the edge of the field, you'll often find it's out of focus. And that's usually because of spherical aberration. Chromatic aberration means that you look through the telescope and you see a whole <laughs> spectrum of colours. And that's because the different colours go through the telescope in different ways. So they were the limitations at that time. And this was the sort of thing that you had to do lens at the front um, on a stand. In order to get around the limitations of chromatic aberration and um, spherical aberration, you need to get a much longer telescope so that the, the lens, which is at the front, uh, has a very long focal length. And uh, the result of doing that is that you get rid of all the colours, but you end up with a very, very narrow field of view, and you can see from the mount, it's very hard to move it. 
pointed. Um, and uh, so these things were present, uh, built by people who were very rich and had a lot of time to play. Some of them got extremely uh, complicated. This is, this is a, um, I'd like to call it a star party, but I'm not sure if I call it that. It, 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 this was an observing. These things were seen as like, space shuttles in their day, and so people would come just to have a look through it. Um, this particular one is an attempt to try and keep the whole thing straight. There's a lens up the front, and the observer down the bottom there on the right, and all the round things along there are just pieces of cardboard with holes to try and restrict the field of view. And uh, some of them got rid of the cardboard and just used string. I don't know if that one ever actually was used, but that was part of the plan. And the secret technology started to appear. First of all, John Doolan um, developed an acrobatic lens. Now, an acrobatic lens is a lens that focuses all the colors into one, one location. And he did it by literally grinding lenses and hand matching them together to see which one worked the best. And then once he got that right, and he was using different glasses to do that, once he got that right, then he, he wrote it all down and kept it secret. So if he wanted an acrobatic lens, he had to go to him. And he became quite rich. Um, the problem with secret glass melts is that they gave inconsistent results. Um, if you've ever gone into glass making, you very quickly discover that there are some glasses that are dead easy to make. You just throw the right materials in and melt the uh, producer melt, and you'll always get roughly the same glass. But some of the more complex glasses um, require really complex melting methods. The first one that they discovered that worked was known as a fleet. And uh, you can see in uh, 1757, um, they, they uh, started to make flints. And the advantage of flints is that they've got very consistent optical properties. And you can combine them with other glass types to make acrobats. Um, the person that really put the whole thing onto um, a scientific fleet, uh, fleet was Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday was one of these people that um, could plan a research program and just go out and do it uh, at nausea. And he made glass, he, he made up blends, he made glasses, and he just made thousands and thousands and thousands of samples with different blends, with different components. And we've still got all these samples are still um, in the Smithsonian Institute. So you can actually go there and see the bits of glass that he's poured out. And he learned how to blend and remelt. Now the one thing he didn't do was control the atmosphere of melting, which is what we use today. Um, a lot of your optical glasses are actually melted in a furnace with a controlled gas over it. And while the, the glass is molten, the gas um, diffuses into the uh, glass and you end up with some of these more special glasses. So fluorites and things like the old here um, on telescopes, you can buy now those like the old like fluorite lenses and things like that. And that's because they that you made the control atmosphere um, Then there was the discovery um, that uh, you could use large flints, the early flint glasses, the melts were not very good. You could only produce lenses about that big. But they very they very quickly learned how to make bigger and bigger lenses. And um, so all the big refractors that are still around today in the old observatories, um, uh, up to 25 centimeters, uh, are made of flints with other types of glasses attached to them. Uh, the 25 centimeter was because um, you couldn't actually hold the telescope up and stop it from um, bending. Nowadays, they can do that. Then we went into commercialization in the 19th century, and there were a whole bunch of people that then started making telescopes and selling them. Um, Alvin Clark was one of the very successful, um, and 
he made a lot of the big refractors. Uh, Grub, which is still running today, um, but they started making um, large reflectors, and uh, Henry uh, did the same thing in France. So these are the forefathers of the telescope making companies. Um, the problem with the refractors, all refractors, the problem with the refractive telescope was that they had pushed the technology as far as they could, and they had to go somewhere else. And the somewhere else was to go to reflectors. And in the corner there we have a couple of small reflectors. In a reflector you actually have a mirror which collects the light and focuses it. Um, and uh, the first ones were in the 17th century. Um, then the theory of how the reflector works was laid down by Gregory who started producing uh, different types of reflectors. And then Newton came along with his first reflector in, in uh, 1668. Um, although Gregory was around before that, a lot of the people who get tagged with the invention aren't necessarily the first people who did it. Um, Gregory, uh, with uh, Newton's um, telescope, he didn't have an eyepiece. You actually had to hold the mirror off to the side and look down into the, into the telescope. So this uh, telescope here, which is one that uh, Newton presented to the Royal Society, it doesn't have an eyepiece. It focuses by moving the separation between the mirror and the front. You then put your eye right to the edge of the telescope, and you look into the telescope. Um, and you make sure your head is not blocking the light and you use your eye to get the image so you can play with it and you'd be surprised. I've done this lots of times. You'd be surprised the image you can get just in your eye. <coughs> so that was Newton, however, people found it too inconvenient. And so Gregory put a secondary mirror inside the telescope and he brought the image outside so that you didn't actually have to put your head into it and uh, Draper took another step forward. Instead of putting a mirror in, he used a prism. A prism allows you to get a much more accurate reflection. So that was the background between the sorts of telescopes that we've got today. And the advantages are that the reflector uh, allows you to have a much lower focal ratio, which means you can get a much wider field of view. Um, the field of view on these early telescopes was minuscule. Um, because it, you're reflecting light, it's basically achromatic, meaning all the colours um, act the same. They still suffer from these other aberrations, and a lot of the telescopes that you'll see outside have got all sorts of um, gizmos attached to, to control these, ab these uh, aberrations. Um, the only thing that they could do with spherical aberration was to use high focal ratios, long telescopes. But by manipulating the surfaces, which we could do today, you could actually bring that focal ratio down. And then Cassegrain invented the folded uh, telescope. So, reflectors. John Herschel built the first of the big reflectors. Um, his, um, the biggest, uh, uh, that's not the first telescope, but the, the big, biggest telescope he built was a 40 inch. Um, and uh, it was a bit of a flop because it was just too big and too heavy. But he made 20 inch uh, scopes, and 10 inch scopes, sold them around the world, and, made, and he ended up with an extremely rich person. Um, but he used metal mirrors. And his telescope mounts, while they work, were extremely difficult to use. Um, the one on the right hand side is the modern Herschel uh, telescope. Um, later on, we start learned how to put silver and then aluminium onto these mirrors, and that made them much more reflective. And the problem with those metal mirrors was that they had to be refigured um, all the time. They basically they lost their they lost their reflectivity, so you had to repolish them. And in fact, the, 
I didn't point it out on the Great Melbourne telescope. Off to the side is a. Well, is it actually that a machine for reef trap? Yeah, we were working on a polishing machine as well. Yeah. Which was at the other end of the building. That was supplied with the telescope because you had every now and again you had to pull the mirror out, re polish it, and they had a, a steam driven, steam driven, I think, a steam driven polishing machine just to redo it. Uh, fortunately, we don't do that anymore. Um, but by the time they got to that point, and this was the point where the Melbourne telescope, as far as I could see, flopped. And that's because it was a visual instrument. You couldn't take photographs and it didn't have the ability to track stars very accurately. So it was very much a visual thing. And telescope designs went off in several directions. So nowadays when you look at the commercial telescopes or the big professional ones, you either have a big, big mirror, 14 meter diameter mirror, which not long ago people would have said it was impossible to do that, but they can do it today. Um, uh, they're, um, they're mostly spin cast, that is you put the glass into a mold, you put it in the oven, you allow everything to melt, and then you spin the whole thing at about 100 RPM or whatever, and the glass will take up a shape uh, because it's spinning, and then you slowly cool it down, and you end up with a really, really good. And then you spend five years polishing it uh, to the right shape. Um, the other type of design is the multi mirror design. You can see it here. I don't think I'll find my pointer. You can see it here where they've got one, two, three, four, five, six mirrors. And the advantage of the six mirrors is that you get more collecting area, so you can collect more light, but you have to have a much more complex telescope to be able to bring all that light together or some combination thereof. And some of the telescopes you see outside are combinations of refractors and mirrors. Um, I've, I've never heard of anyone in the amateur game making multi mirrors. Do you know anyone that's made a, a multiple mirror scope? Binoculars, I guess. No. So, in terms of uh, reflectors, uh, the modern scopes nowadays, the really expensive ones, are basically combinations of mirrors and lenses. The advantage of doing that is that you can uh, correct a lot of these aberrations. And uh, probably the one that uh, had the biggest effect was the Schmidt camera in the uh, early 20th century by a chap called Schmidt. Um, and he was the first person to come up with a camera that could photograph that much sky in one year. So instead of tiny little dots, he could photograph great slabs of sky. Uh, and then the design started to change, so we then started to see very high focal ratio mirrors being used. Um, the one that uh, probably, in my opinion, gave the best result was the Ross Corrector. But the problem with that was it's super expensive. Today, you've got Schmidt Cassegrain. Here is a Schmidt Cassegrain. Lens in front, mirror at the back. And that's probably the most common one. Down in the observatory, you've got several of those uh, types of scopes. Um, or if you wanted to get much faster lenses, you could go for a low focal ratio, like F3 and down to F2. And the, the two types there that that's SIGOF. That's a Max SIGOF there. It has three lens in the front. And I've got a Max SIGOF at home. So I've kept a couple in the car. Uh, and the advantage of the Max SIGOF is that it corrects um, the, uh, uh, the uh, spherical aberration without the complicated surfaces that we have in the Schmidt Cancer And they are blurred up with the Max SIGOF telescope, which is that type of thing. Or you end up with a pseudo astrographic photograph. Well, the thing about the astrograph is that the, the uh, film or the imaging equipment uh, is inside the telescope. So it's a bit harder to get. And then if you really want to go complicated, and um, you know how people play with these things, um, you can 
go for complicated surfaces. Uh, depending on how complicated you want to make the surface, you can correct just about anything. <laughs> and uh, the, the next generation telescopes there are, um, I'm not sure how the technology will work, but it'll be um, uh, computer controlled curve generation. Uh, one that uh, we looked at some time back was water jet. Um, is, has people heard about water jet cutting? If you go down to to get some some steel cut or, um, uh, or, or plastic or anything like that, uh, it's often done by a water jet, very high pressure water jet. Um, I've seen water jet cut glass that thing. Uh, not put your finger in there. But the thing about water jet is that you can <coughs> smooth the surface off, you can do polishing, that sort of thing, very fast. And if you want to. If you want a lens that's got a wobble in the middle, the computer can do it for you. So I suspect that the next generation of telescopes might be done that way. Um, or, or you start to do it by hand. So, where does it go from here? Um, Multiscopes are coming, electronic uh, adaptive optics. The um, telescope up at uh, Kudavarabrand has adaptive optics at the top end of it. So it can literally change the shape of the lens in real time, hundreds of times a second. Um, and uh, so it will measure the image, decide what's, what's wrong and correct it. Um, and that type of adaptive optics is actually coming into amateurs, although more advanced amateurs. Um, small astrographs with um, CCD cameras, your electronic cameras these days, it is amazing how much the um, photography has uh, changed in hobby. Um, CCDs, the sort of thing you've got in your SLR digital camera, is extremely sensitive and can produce fantastic pictures. I can't see too many around here. Um, those ones up there are, are taken with digital cameras. Um, when I first started on this, it was all done by film. And uh, film was very, very slow. So you had to do it differently. But nowadays, you can just put your camera on a tripod and come up with fantastic shots. It takes all the fun out of it. Though. And then finally, space based, space based telescopes. And we have the Hubble. We have a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, telescopes in orbit. Uh, some of them are, are orbiting the sun. Um, the first X-ray telescope, or, or rather, first ultraviolet telescope, was actually uh, on the Apollo um, program. It was taken up there by Apollo 11, set up on the surface, and then uh, after they finished the job, they picked it up and took it back. So the very first ultraviolet photographs were taken from the moon. Now, this is the bit that I used to do, and I really enjoy this, and that is um, looking at telescope design from an artistic point of view. And every, every amateur that has a telescope loves their telescope because of, it's got particular characteristics that they like. And I've got there that art is a combination of intellect, creativity, and dexterity that's recognised in value as greater than the sum of the parts. And that particular telescope there is actually a satellite tracking um, camera, um, which is still in use. And these are photographs of various amateur telescopes and mounts. And as I said, each, each amateur loves his own little telescope. There is no such thing as the perfect instrument. These instruments are uh, peculiar to that individual. That's the commercial one there. And this particular person obviously wanted to do this telescope the personality. All right, so that's the, what have I done there?
So that's a quick, a quick shot of the history of telescope making. Oh, this is the start. I should have mentioned my name's Peter Lowe, and I guess by now everybody knows where the toilets are. They're up the pathway there. Tea, coffee, and uh, biscuits are outside, and uh, you won't have to worry about things running in the dark because it's going to be dark until about eight o'clock. And if we do it, this is a, just a diagram to show how we exit the building. Oh, telescope learning. Day. 